Now, obviously, if you have the biggest bucks in the neighborhood jumping around on your land and, uh, and you see them all fall, you have great whitetail habitat because it takes great whitetail habitat to have those and your hunting game is probably on too because it doesn't take very much to spook those deer. But I want you, whether you're, you know, you're going out to um, public land, if you're looking at a new private land lease, land to buy, somewhere to hunt, new hunting grounds, I want to give you some signs that you're on to something when it comes to finding a great spot to hunt. Some of these have to do with habitat a little bit more. Some simply have to do with indicator species, and we'll talk about that. Number one, this is something I encourage when people are looking for land to buy, lease, and this can apply to even um, public land too, is you like to see some open ground. Now, when it relates to public land, open ground is great because it signifies diversity. So whether it's old fallow fields that have been turned into public land, an old home site, area that has apple orchards, a diversity of habitat, more upland appeal, shrubs, briars, weeds, grasses, then that level of diversity is indica indicative of great whitetail habitat. Now when it's private land, I love open ag ground because although I don't think it's a good idea to own ag, ag ground within your whitetail paradise, it's great to have whitetail ground that you can actually, or ag ground that you can convert to whitetail habitat. You can do that quickly. We use switchgrass to get to six, seven feet tall in the second year. That provides that cover, that base of cover, and then we can use your imagination for early successional growth, planting briars, shrubs, trees, seeds, like maple seeds, box elder seeds, pollinator blends. There's a lot of ways that you can plant quickly and grow some type of browse, but you have to have that cover. So within that ag open ground, you can convert that right away. You can create food plots in that. I'd rather see someone with 80 acres of land. They have 20 acres of ag field they can convert than 160 acres of hardwood that they don't have openings in because it's going to take a lot of money to create the diversity on open hardwoods and that land compared to that ground that's 80 acres with 20 30 acres of ag land that you can immediately convert or open ground pasture ground something else it creates diversity and so right away that's a sign if you have open ground great if it's all hardwoods bad number two indicator species what are they Pheasants, grouse, rabbits. If you have a lot of those on your land, especially grouse related more to the north where you have aspen regeneration or hardwood regeneration, very good indication that you have good cover and that means you have good browse or good um, um, food or browse food component during the bedding area hours during the day. Grouse need that younger growth. They need that diversity of growth of aspen regeneration, hardwood regeneration. Pheasants. Pheasants need good edge, edge habitat. They need thick enough cover that stands up to winter time or they're going to die every winter. You know, a lot of times pheasants are disappearing from areas. It's no phenomenon, it's no disease, it's no increase in predation. What it is, is increase, it's a decrease of escape cover. Think about ag lands where all the fence rows and, and clean cropping. Farm fields that used to have a 20 foot or 10 foot wide fence row for a half mile separating two ag fields. Now it's all the same. It's a few more rows and you can't blame farmers for that. The point is that we're losing that edge habitat and ag land all around. We're losing cover that actually stands up. Think about it in those hedgerows and fence rows, you had briars, vines, shrubs, apple trees, areas where, that can protect pheasants and rabbits from above. A lot of times that's what we're losing. That's what picking off these birds is actually predators from above. And then if they don't have that thick escape cover, if it's not thick enough to actually protect them from above, it's probably not protecting them on the ground horizontally from fox, bobcat, coyote, dogs, cats, whatever it might be. You have to have that early successional growth and cover. So when you go on a land that has pheasants, you know, that's one of the indicators I love to see with clients is by the second year, third year, fourth year, they're telling me, hey, we have a load of pheasants on the property. We heard five roosters this year in our third year on this land. That steps in the right direction because we have all the edging up to 30, 40 feet wide of switchgrass around the entire property. And it supports and is adjacent to that early successional growth cover and hardwood regeneration, cuttings in the woods. We have an explosion of rabbits, pheasants, and we even have grouse on the property. Those are all great indicator species that you're headed in the right direction or you've found something special. Number three, zero summer big boys. What do I mean by that? The biggest bucks in the neighborhood, if they are not on your land during the summer, that's more of a good sign than a bad sign. Much more of a good sign than a bad sign. Not to say you don't have an occasional big one on your property. In fact, when someone else is on their land 
messing with tree stands, going for a ride out in the woods, in their open, mature hardwoods, over beans, hay, out in the ag fields, that summer food source, then they're gonna bump those deer, and they're gonna come over to your land, and they're gonna tell you where they're gonna walk through during the fall. It's pretty easy. When they're not during the summer, they're during the summer regularly, but then they just show up for a day or two. That means they are kicked off somewhere else. They're going back where they feel safe in the fall, and they're going to show you exactly where to, to hang a tree stand. That's why I like having my scrapes out, my mock scrapes. I'll start those if they're new ones in June, July, because I want when those bucks to come back, I want them to get used to that mock scrape being there. Used to it meaning they'll hit it right away, but then it establishes that pattern of use every time they're on the land, and it lets me know that, hey, my stand's in the right location. Because when they come through there in the summer, they're typically traveling through where they're at during the fall. That's what they're familiar with. And then they go back to their summer hangouts, which is hopefully not the land that you're finding. Because if you have a large percentage of those summer bucks in your land during the summer, or those big boys in those big mature velvet antlers on your land, a high percentage of them, it's not a good indication for the fall for your ability to not only build a herd if you're on private land, but to find and hunt a good herd on public land. Number four. The four bedding habitat types, this is something I recognized, wrote about in a Quality Whitetails magazine of the QDMA many years ago. It might have been 10 years, 12 years, eight years, I'm not really sure, but it's quite a, quite a while ago. Where something I talked about, written about for a long time, is the bedding habitats of briars, weeds, and grasses. That's one. Hardwood regenerations, two. Shrubs, number three. And conifers, number four. If you have those four bedding habitats in one spot, you have diversity, you have edge, and you're going to have whitetails. You're gonna have a lot of small game cover too. That's a great indication, just those four habitats alone, that you have good quality whitetail. You found something great to hunt, whether it's on public or private land. If you have two or three of those in one spot, awesome. You don't necessarily have to have four, but you have to have four. those four that I recognized a long time ago and wrote about, and those four, those type of whitetail bedding habitats that you need to find for you to have really good um, cover on your land. And notice I didn't say anything about hardwoods and big open story hardwoods. And that goes back to the 50 yard summer test. I was on a client property in Michigan a while back where I could see 250 yards through the woods during the summertime. This was in full leaf out. They had maintained that land as mature oak, as a mature oak, oak forest. And you could see several hundred yards at a time through that land, it was ridiculous. What's that mean? Sometimes some really cool summer sightings of some nice bucks in the area, and rarely a fall sighting of those bucks, and they had a 25 year history or more on the land. Does your land pass 50 yard test? What does that mean, 50 yards? If you can see more than 50 yards during the summertime on your land in most locations, you're going to have bad whitetail habitat. Now, public land might be a little bit different. If you can see 75 yards, but most of the rest of the land in that public land or federal or state lands or commercial forestry, wherever you're allowed to hunt, is 100, 150 yards of sight during the summer, 200 yards, and you found an area where it's more like 75, well, it's all relative. But bottom line is in private land, typically, you're not going to find something if you're looking at through the woods and you can see more than 50 yards. You can expand that a little bit to public land because everything's bigger, broader, more of a monoculture. And so typically when you find sight lines that aren't that great on public land, you're into changes of habitat. You're going from upland area down to lowland swampland, hardwood regeneration with cuttings, and you're getting in that transition area where you're finding shorter sight lines. And that's a good thing and indicative of a really good diversity of habitat. Number six, historical sign. Historical sign, it's better to find sign that shows a use of patterns, funnels, corridors, and you especially applies to public land too, that shows it's been around for 10 years, eight years. I like finding those big signpost rubs out in the swamp area where every buck that passes by that rub hits it. And so it's bowed out. I can remember jack pine in the UP of Michigan. I actually hunted near there last year where there's jack pine. If there's a big buck in the area, I can go right to that one rub and see if there's a rub on it. And typically looking at that area for 15, 20 years, if there's a rub on it, that's actually going back to 98, 99. So whatever that adds up to, but a long time. If there's a rub on it, there's a big buck in the area. If there's not, there's not. It's pretty simple. It's a big tree. It's carved out and it's pretty cool when you see that, but it's historical. It's been there for a long time. So much of the trees bowed out in the middle of a swamp. When you're finding obvious uses of a licking branch that look like they've been there for years, rubs 
an area that where there's old, fresh, new, big, small, then you know that you found something special just based on historical sign. Far too often people are scouting during the summertime and into September they're looking for those first rubs, those first scrapes. That's pretty cool when they're there. But to find a truly good spot on public land, you're going to find areas that have historical sign, not current sign. Current sign is great. It verifies that a buck's there at the moment. Just like in the UP of Michigan, if there's a big rub on that jack pine, I know a big buck's there. But it's based on the whole overall movement or historical sign and patterns. And it's... It's a trend you see on uh, private land. When I go to private parcels that have very few bucks and the landowners are telling me, we've had a picture of a couple spikes and four points and maybe a two-year-old, three-year-old, there's not gonna be a lot of rubs on the property. And where you find overpressured land, you'll find not a lot of rubs in the pressured area. And then this little corner over here, they never walk through. Crazy how you go in there and find three or four rubs. Only rubs on the property. I've seen that in 40 acres in Michigan where the only rubs were the area in the swamp where they never walk through. It's too wet. It's out of the way to stand locations. It's crazy how the rubs end up there. But bottom line is if you don't have a lot of rubs on your property, you don't have a lot of bucks. There's some good studies that show, good studies out there that show that the more rubs you have, the bigger the rubs you have overall, the more bucks you have on the property. I've seen one mature buck, about a six, seven year old buck. He was chasing around a three-year-old buck. They had a doe. He stopped and made 30, 40 rubs in five minutes. That little buck wouldn't have done that. In a year and a half old buck, they find only makes a handful of rubs a year. Two-year-old might make dozens. A three-year-old might make a hundred or more. Or a four or five-year-old, they might make hundreds. And so it's exponentially greater the number of rubs the older a buck becomes. And typically he'll rub larger trees. Not to say he won't rub a small one. Not to say a small buck won't rub a small tree. But the number of rubs is really indicative of the number of bucks and age of bucks on the land. Cool thing is with rubs, they're a good indication that you have a lot of bucks in the area, but you need to know that rubs are usually only hit one to two times, three times a year. So if you have a big rub, it looks really cool, a lot of shavings on the top, you put a camera on it, and typically that buck will go by there one time. Not to say he's not in the area, but sometimes he just made it on a whim. Like those rubs in that one spot, they're off to the side by a house that buck was never back. I know he wasn't back because I shot him that afternoon, but bottom line is there's no reason for him to ever go back to the area he was just tending a doe. So it can be very deceiving when you see a big cluster of rubs. It's got to have historical sign to it. It's got to have historical significance to show that those bucks have been in that area for a very long time for it to really, really matter. Scrapes, on the other hand, perennial scrapes, they'll hit over and over again. Some bucks hitting the same scrape dozens of times many, many more times than they hit rubs. That's why I don't like fake rubs or anything because that's cool to get a picture of a buck hitting a fake rub here and there, but I want when that buck goes through to hit that mock scrape every single time he walks by. We teach you how to do that too. We teach you how to do that in our mock scrape playlist. Check that out. Look at my original mock scrape, mock vine scrape that came up with a long time ago and uh, check out how that's done. And we have, in all our videos going back for many years, we have a lot of supporting footage of those bucks coming in using those scrapes. No scent, cheap to make. We average about 50 cents uh, to make that, which is just some parachute cord to tie it up. And that's about it. Number seven, lower the value of the timber in the area you're hunting. This especially applies to public land too, whether you're buying land, leasing land, or you're looking for land to hunt in public land area. The lower the value of the timber, the more browse species you're going to have, the more prolific sprouters and regeneration you're going to have. But then low value timber also includes shrubs, briars, weeds, grasses, a lot of low value area. If you have high timber value, hard maple, hard cherry, big oaks, unless those oaks are just a pile of white oaks in early September to early October out on public land somewhere where no one else is gonna go to, or a pile of red oaks. The problem is a lot of times on public land, there's red oaks everywhere or there's white oaks here and there. People are hunting out in the big mature forest. There's no cover there. So bottom line is, the lower the value of the timber, box elder, aspen, ash, regenerating ash, you can cut it on private land, get it to regenerate and not be suspect to the emerald ash borer. Birch, shrubs, briars, the lower the value, as long as it's not underwater or terribly rocky, then the higher the whitetail value. So whether you're buying land this year, looking for your new land to hunt, these are some great signs that the whitetail habitat you just found is going to be a success, not only in attracting whitetails at the right time of the year, meaning fall and winter months, but also providing a great hunt 
in allowing you to find that whitetail, that big buck of your dreams. Once you have that good habitat, then it's just a matter of the lowest hole in the bucket. Always remember is how you hunt the land. Great habitat will always allow you to hunt the land better because it's thicker. Your presence is less projected to the whitetails on the land. So find some great whitetail habitat this off season, especially if you're hunting public land. If you always do what you've always done, you always will get what you've always had. A lot of people are beating themselves, beating their head against the wall every time they go out into public land because they're hunting in the same spot that Uncle Larry shot a giant buck 32 years ago and they're wondering why they're not getting different results. Instead, go out there, find these seven things right here, find those signs of great whitetail hunt, and you can change your hunt not only this year, but for many seasons, decades yet to come. Folks, I wanna make sure you check out my web class video series, whether it's how to design your food plot program or how to design your property in general. And we have a new one coming out that'll be how to hunt the rut. But these bucks back here are testament. Some of these bucks go back to 93. They're even in different states. I urge you to check out those web classes so that you can help yourself, help your land, help your hunt. The link is in the description. And also for those that have tried them out, I encourage you to offer some feedback in the comments below. Thank you.